Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. Today we're talking about sexual function, sexual dysfunction, uh, and more than that, kind of what do you do about it? What are your options? And what are the benefits and risks? How do these things work? So uh, this may be a fairly lengthy podcast. We may split it into two. We'll kind of see how things go as we come along. But a lot of people don't quite understand the terms when they're talking about a sexual issue. So very frequently someone will say, oh, I have a low libido and it's my job to figure out what exactly they mean by that. Is this an issue of their libido is lower than their partners, lower mm -hmm. than it used to be? Um, are their organs not functioning properly from a erection or lubrication standpoint? Uh, is it just low desire, which is what in my mind constitutes libido, sort of the drive. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, uh, a lot of puns I can make with that statement that you made as well. But uh, we've talked about things like post finasteride syndrome and uh, sexual health in regards to that. We've talked about hormonal impacts on sexual health. And we've also talked about sexual health optimization a little bit. But we really haven't talked about the pathology and done a general overarching uh, view of sexual health. So uh, like anything else, you want to be able to qualify and quantify your health in some way. Um, there are some things that I know, at least I've mentioned on podcast multiple times before, some of these medications are approved for hypoactive sexual disorder. So again, like you were mentioning, what the heck is hypoactive sexual disorder? That could mean a very different thing depending on who your spouse is or who you are. Yeah. And this is one of those cases where, again, you know, we've used this line previously, CBT is always the right answer. There's nothing wrong with, you know, couples therapy or sex therapy. And actually, when you combine that with mm -hmm. you know, testosterone, for example, yep. um, you tend to see better outcomes than if you do one alone. So like all things, there's multiple facets to approach it from. Um, so we have what we've kind of, I believe we both discussed this before, sort of the sexual function triad, we can call it. Um, so you have organ function. Um, this is blood flow, erection, lubrication. Um, basically, is blood getting to the area? Is the organ functioning properly? Yep. Then you have number two, which is the desire. And this is sort of what I think of as being dopaminergic or the drive, uh, the want to have sex. Uh, and then you have your third portion of this sort of imagined as a triangle. Uh, and that's the parasympathetic response. So the ability to relax. Um, and this, I think, comes more into play when you're looking at things like anorgasmia uh, or where people mm -hmm. are, are not able to kind of unwind or unplug from their day-to-day -day lives and get into, you know, the mood. Yeah, certainly. Um, there's a lot of tug of wars that come to play in sexual health. So having optimal sexual health is not really, um, you know, just hammering this one mechanism more, more, more. It's really more like uh, teeter-totter and you're taking things like dopamine and prolactin and trying to have a healthy balance um, between those two. Taking things like serotonin and dopamine and having a healthy balance, it's important. And by the way, a lot of these things, when you're talking about function, you're talking about lubrication, you're talking about um, tissue erection, it's both in males and females. The anatomy is different, but there is certainly erectile tissue um, a relatively equal amount of erectile tissue just in different places in males and females. And then um, obviously lubrication as well. I know uh, at some point uh, we've touched on foreskin and circumcision and we've kind of teased a future podcast that will be more exclusively on that. Um, but that's certainly a mucous membrane, um, a potential mucous membrane, I suppose. When it comes to um, dopamine and prolactin, uh, we briefly talked about premature ejaculation versus delayed ejaculation. A lot of that balance actually has to do with serotonin and dopamine. And in other countries, uh, we, I know we've gotten a lot of questions about dipoxetine, mm -hmm. different fast-acting SSRIs that, um, to my knowledge, are still not um, uh, like approved in the, in United, the United States. States. Right. But they are in other countries, so um, we'll briefly touch about um, some of those things in the future as well. However, the concentration of today's podcast is more on the optimization of function or correcting um, a suboptimal function. So we'll talk a lot about dopamine agonists. We'll talk about um, alpha adrenergic antagonists. We'll talk about your PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra, Cialis, the generics, um, and some other things like uh, Vilesi or Bremelanotide. 
Yeah, I think that's a great overview, kind of giving people a, a table of contents. And PDE fives are probably the most well known. I mean, I think the, the I don't think there's a product or a pharmaceutical that has better brand recognition than Viagra, which obviously is cheap now. Its patent has expired. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and cheap if cheap if you know how to use GoodRx. Cheap if you don't shop at CVS. Yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, it's sort of been replaced by Tadalafil. Um, I don't know a lot of people that are still prescribing uh, Viagra in our, our circle of colleagues. Um, I'm sure there's some people that are on it. It's working well for them and they don't really want to change things and that's fine. Um, this was a, the first study we'll start with is yeah, the partner's choice or partner's preferred study, something like that they called it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they gave men uh, sildenafil and tadalafil. And then they asked their partners, their wives or girlfriends, which they preferred them to take. And almost 80% of women preferred their partners to use Tadalafil. Uh, about 15% preferred the sildenafil. Um, and I'm not a mathematician, but that sounds like about 5% of women preferred their partner to be impotent. So neither sildenafil or Tadalafil. That is very interesting. Um, and I suppose it does not surprise me. There is uh, a lot of uh, sociology, I guess, that comes into um, partner preference. But yeah, by and large, uh, this makes sense. Tadalafil has a much longer half-life. Um, it That's just about what you would expect. Yeah. And to your point earlier about what constitutes like hypoactive sexual desire disorder, one of the hallmarks, and I think the most important one, is that it has to be distressing to that person. Mm-hmm. If someone is totally satisfied with their level of libido, but it's lower than the average in the population, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with someone having a higher than average libido. I mean, there is certainly you know hypersexuality, and that can be problematic due to a number of reasons. But mm-hmm. you know, the distress is usually a hallmark of that hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So someone says oh, like my partner's libido isn't high enough. Well, that's not necessarily a partner problem. Mm -hmm. Um, But if someone is, you know, open to, or if they think that, hey, I could be better than I am now in terms of my drive, um, there's certainly things you can explore. PDE5s are primarily used in men, um, but there's been a handful of data in women as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually in some disease states, it's hard to find a, like, healthy young adult population that is using Tadalafil. Usually it's Mm -hmm. uh, conditions where there's some vascular compromise and just improving blood flow overall to the organs or uh, in type one diabetics. I know there's a study that tends to get Mm -hmm. cited a lot, Um, but we found this interesting case series. It was about 16 different patients and it was about 50, 50. So we'll kind of go through the details of that. And they were treated with either Tadalafil or Sildenafil. Yeah. So in this, um, I guess, case series of 16 individuals, they looked at the criteria or they looked at the characteristics of those that responded and then the criteria of those that responded. So one of the things that the study did really well is they included females that um, very likely did not have, and by the way, some of the things that they were treating, anorgasmia, lack of sexual desire or libido, and they included individuals that were very likely on other medications that were um, leading to these symptoms and that uh, nitric oxide or blood flow is not leading to the symptoms. So I guess some background on that, PDE5 inhibitors are basically, uh, PDE5 is going to metabolize nitric oxide. You don't want too much nitric oxide. It's technically, um, you know, carcinogenic, um, kind of a reactive oxygen species. But, um, that, you know, you definitely want a happy medium level and levels tend to rise quite a bit as age progresses. Um, It happens in most uh, cases of aging. Yes, things like testosterone can support it. We'll talk about that later. But it was good to see that um, some of the individuals that they studied, you would look at them and you would say, there's no way that they are gonna respond to to Tadalafil, and they did not. Yeah, and I mean, it's about 50-50, so eight out of the six improved. Um, One of the things they had in common was that they were in happy, stable relationships. So Mm -hmm. I I think that is foundational and would tend to lead to more improvement because you have less of a moving target and less other confounding variables. Um, But they had women on oral contraceptives. They did Uh, not, they tended to not improve if they were on oral contraceptives. uh, uh, Women on um, mood stabilizers or anti-seizure medications. Yep, 
So the Tegretol there, yeah. that's definitely a confounder. And then different types of partners. So uh, anything from an aggressive partner to Did a not su improve. supportive husband. Uh, it's complicated uh, is what I would call this one. Yeah, there is an, it's complicated. Um, a lot of them mentioned a husband and this one mentioned a... Difficult relationship with a married man. So presumably this was not the woman's not. husband, yes. but a married man that she was pursuing. Yes, which is kind of confusing that that individual be entered in a study. Um, but I guess, again, when if you're doing a, a series like this of several cases, it's only a small handful, 16 is obviously a pretty low sample size, then looking at the individual cases gives you a good clinical takeaway of, yes, although pharmacotherapy is great, supplements and medications are tools to help with your lifestyle for health optimization, it's good to uh, keep in mind your social health um, and uh, other psychological and sociology factors that would come into play. Yeah, so the way I kind of view this, and I don't know how this academic center was set up, but I presume it's sort of a sexual function clinic where they're like, hey, we're just gonna put everybody on a PDE5 and see what happens. And they probably got a better result than they would have expected. I mean, with mm -hmm. this population of, you know, a very mixed population, yep. not everyone being you know young, healthy, ideal candidates, having a 50% response rate is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I was curious about is in several other patients, three of them it looks like, they had just started HRT. They were you know probably average age of about 50, early 50s. Mm -hmm. And that I know of, and perhaps we could dig into this a bit deeper, the HRT regimen that they were started on is certainly a confounder as well. Yeah, and I don't think that data was available, although it probably, not available to us, but it was probably available to the authors because yep. all of this was taken from visit notes. Like, so it was a very yep. sort of meticulous, um, obviously you can tell by the detailed history some of the providers took, like, hey, this uh, woman is in a relationship with another married man. Like, That's a pretty interesting detail to include there where we don't know the type of HRT. Yeah, That would be a nice detail to know as well. You not could, quite as juicy, but you, still. Yeah, uh, you could speculate if they had not been started on HRT, if they're started on estrogen and progestin HRT, then that can suppress their endogenous androgens that they're having. And perhaps they actually would have had a better result if they had not concurrently started HRT. Whereas if they had started, let's say, just a low dose of testosterone or a testosterone patch, which we're about to talk about, plus some estrace topical vaginal cream, perhaps they would have had a much better result. Yeah, it, it's almost a case of doing too many things at once and then you, know, you can certainly have confounders or have even benefits sort of cancel out. Um, so our, our next category would be androgens. I mean, uh, obviously it's fairly well known these are important for men's drive and desire and libido, um, but it also for women. And this is something that is well established and I'll never pass up an opportunity to say that the number of men studied for the initial Viagra trials to get the approval is less than the number of women that have been studied on testosterone now for improving libido. And we still have no FDA approved product. I think the UK is also going to beat the United States to a, like whatever the equivalent of the FDA over there is an approved, you know, testosterone formulation for women. So yeah, always throw that out there. I didn't believe the statistic when I first heard it, but it is in fact true. Yeah, it's really disappointing, and we have certainly touched on this before, but there are a lot of safe, relatively well-studied preparations of testosterone that are tolerated in women. Um, that being said, a lot of it can be reverse engineered from men. Yes, uh, males and females are different. We've talked about the difference in the response of uh, insulin sensitivity in males versus insulin resistance in females with insulin clamp studies but the response for libido is relatively the same. Uh, again, uh, I guess uh, I'm gonna say individualized, so people that take a drink every time I say individualized, you go ahead and do so. But you have to look at an individualized regimen. Um, with females, there is a wider variation in the amount of androgen production than in males. So think about your average male, let's say they have a total testosterone somewhere between 200 and 900 for an andropausal male. For females, you could have a um, 
a much wider variation that is considered normal. But is it really normal if, uh, let's say, a female that has very low adrenal androgen production, they don't have PCOS, and they go through menopause, their ovaries slowly cease producing testosterone. They, they produce some, or maybe they have an ovarectomy. Um, and then they have a total testosterone of five, and that's considered normal. Whereas a different female, um, perhaps they have very high amount of adrenal androgen production. Maybe they also have an ovarectomy, but they have a total testosterone of 60. So, you know, kind of extreme examples, but um, that's a lot of variation. Yeah, especially to be considered within the, the normal range. There, it would, the equivalent would be if you expanded the reference range from men all the way from, let's say, 300 to 3,000, yep. something like that. Uh, which is an extreme example, but sort of makes the case that there's more variation there. Uh, so I guess starting with testosterone in men, the recent Traverse study uh, was an interesting one. We did a, a full podcast on that, talked about uh, what was shown and what was not shown. And in this, uh, they were on testosterone two years, sexual activity improved, hypogonadal symptoms improved, sexual desire improved, but erectile dysfunction did not. Mm -hmm. it, the authors speculate, and, and based on what we know about this population, you know, very unhealthy yep. at baseline, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, on beta blockers, you know, lots of things going on here. And the author said yep. cardiovascular disease was likely the cause of the erectile dysfunction, not necessarily the low testosterone. Yep. Uh, again, canary in the coal mine, just like they had a canary in a coal mine, the canary would die of carbon monoxide poisoning before the coal miner would. Um, Sometimes the erectile function is the first thing to go because of atherosclerosis and plaque buildup, whether that's due to ApoB or LP little a. Yes, LP little a can lead to erectile dysfunction. Um, stole that idea from somebody else, but uh, <laughs> certainly uh, anything that causes atherosclerosis can lead to poor blood flow. Um, so that's something that you want to look into and was likely at least part of the cause in this case. Yeah, and this is in the sort of elderly and, and sick population. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of younger men who are, let's say, below the age of 40. Uh, they probably have normal testosterone levels, even if they're slightly unhealthy. Uh, and in that group, insulin resistance is actually the most common cause of the erectile dysfunction. And you can cover that up with medications, but you're not mm. truly treating the root cause. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with allowing someone to function sexually while they're improving their health. Mm -hmm. But you do have to be frank and say, hey, I think, you know, this is what's going to contribute to a continued process. And this really isn't a long term solution that's going to solve your problem forever. Yeah. For the average person, about 40 percent of erectile dysfunction is psychogenic, which is a relatively high number. But it's also a relatively low number um, because a lot of people have erectile dysfunction and uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome is very common. Um, dyslipidemia is also very common. Yeah, I believe it tracks about 10% per decade. Um, but there are certainly you know, plenty of 80-year-olds out there who are metabolically healthy without. Yep. And certainly plenty of 20 and 30-year-olds that are experiencing erectile dysfunction. We are sorry if uh, your hopes and dreams of us saying that endocrine disruptors are the most common cause of erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Not the case, at least not yet. Um, another study, and I thought this was interesting because the populations that are treated with testosterone are a very heterogeneous population. Same thing here. Uh, basically, they had an improvement at one month in the study after testosterone treatment. Um, the improvement was not maintained at three and six months. So it suggested, again, that the etiology of the erectile dysfunction was influenced by other comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So don't look just at the testosterone. I know that a lot of clinics will say, do you have erectile dysfunction? And then if the answer is yes, then you need testosterone. If your Adam score is anything, you need testosterone. If you can spell the word Adam, you need testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you have uh, cortisol excess too, if you take our quiz. Um, so now we move over to testosterone in women. Um, and this was a study in postmenopausal women who also began mm. HRT at the same time. So mm -hmm. some form of systemic estrogen, estradiol, I believe. Uh, and they were taking an oral testosterone yeah. preparation, a oral proprietary testosterone. one. Yeah. So not anything that is commercially available, but it was a 
40 milligram dose, which is substantially lower than what's out there commercially now. They're taking it twice per week. Mm -hmm. um, and it was effective. They had improvements above and beyond what the estrogen only group had. Yep. But take a look at those adverse effects there. Yeah. So uh, very interesting. Remember Acne. here, placebo is estrogen only. Yep. So if it's estrogen only, then that is theoretically, at least in many people, suppressing endogenous testosterone. So it's really comparing testosterone to inhibiting testosterone, especially free androgens. Estrogen will greatly decrease your free androgen index by increasing SHBG. Um, mostly so if it's oral, but because of first pass, but in general it will. But anyway, they looked at acne and about um, 15 to 17%, 17% in the testosterone group. Again, 35 individuals in both groups, so not a huge study. Yeah, but and not big statistically enough. significant. Yeah, so uh, scientists can not listen. This is uh, probably clinically significant though, uh, at least the lack of <laughs> difference. 17% in testosterone, 14% in placebo, p-value 0.1 with hirsutism, which is unwanted hair growth, 8.8% versus 8.5%. So what this tells me is if you decrease your testosterone, you will grow hair on, you'll grow a beard 8% of the time and you'll get acne 14% of the time. Yeah, it was really interesting to me because presumably women didn't know if they were in the placebo or testosterone group. Nope. So women, they're not stupid. They know what testosterone is. Yep. So they started in this trial taking their testosterone or placebo and checking for these things, and they realized, oh, I do have some hairs on my chin, or oh, I am getting an odd pimple here or there. Yep. So estrogen is not causing women to grow beards, but even if you look at um, placebo group and like Turner syndrome, for example, mm -hmm. about 6% of those in placebo group are saying, yes, this medication caused me to virilize, mm -hmm. when they did not actually get no, oxandrolone. They were getting yep. the placebo for their acceleration of growth. Yep. So 8% of women, I wouldn't be surprised if it was over 10% cumulatively over the lifetime, are going to have some signs of hirsutism just by nature of their androgen sensitivity or their own androgen production. Yeah. Or uh, their insulin resistance and low SHBG at baseline. Yeah. Probably now more than if we went back 20, 30 years ago, people that became uh, more insulin resistant. Yep. We mentioned uh, testosterone patches, um, and some people might be familiar with these in men, but uh, you can also give them to women. Um, and props to the people who studied the patch. Um, the dosage is pretty interesting in this chart. If we paste this in, yes, it says grams per day, but it was definitely not um, <laughs> uh, 300 grams per day. It was uh, 300 micrograms per day. Much more so, reasonable dose. Um, you know, something like a, a 0.3 or a 0.45 milligram dose. And um, they looked at a lot of adverse effects. And yes, for some of them, you do see a dose-dependent effect. They also looked at um, levels of both testosterone and DHT. And I think they used equilibrium dialysis to measure those. Yeah, for the free hormones, yes. Uh, the thing here that was striking to me, but makes sense with as many testosterone levels as I've seen on people using transdermal products, is that the DHT was... Uh, quite high. So the highest the total testosterone levels approached was just north of 100. Um, I think it was around 115 in the highest dose group, uh, mm -hmm. but they had a DHT level of 30. Mm -hmm. And you would tend to expect about a 5 to 10% conversion, probably slightly on the higher end of that for women from their natural yep. production. Uh, certain things like insulin resistance can accelerate that. There's medications that can reduce that conversion rate. But whenever you're applying testosterone to the skin, you get a disproportionately higher amount of DHT. So this would tend to be less sustainable in my mind as an option for improving libido, but a great option as a sort of test drive is how I talk to it because you don't want to go get a testosterone pellet put in and then find out that, oh, this isn't a good fit for me and now you have to ride it out for three or four months. Uh, mm -hmm. testosterone cream can be a nice way to see, you know, dip your toes in the water and see, do you have any adverse effects? Are you a good candidate for you? Are you even a responder to it? Because mm -hmm. again, you know, not 100% of women are going to respond to testosterone in terms of improving libido or sexual function. Yeah, low barrier to entry. So um, 
pretty easy. They don't do an injection training. They don't have to um, spend a whole bunch of money getting a pellet just because they think it might work. Um, but uh, yeah, another decent uh, population would be women who happen to be or happen to need to be on dutasteride for another reason. Um, Cause that'll obviously inhibit some of the conversion of DHT. Um, and this is for both men and women, the dermal conversion, um, especially if it is in pubic skin. Uh, for example, scrotal or labial skin, you'll have an even higher rate of conversion of testosterone to DHT. So you really have to watch for virilization or in men, excess growth of the prostate, um, heart tissue or hair loss. Yeah, certainly things to consider. And, and you don't always need to check a DHT level to know these things, but it is nice to see the data uh, when you have the ability to do so. Um, so then long-term safety, I think this was the longest sort of study, if we can call it that, that I've seen it was about five years in duration. And they were just basically looking at a electronic health record, you know, a, a medical system and seeing women that were treated with some form of testosterone and did any majorly bad things happen to them? So mm -hmm. they were looking at ischemic heart disease, breast cancer, and those are the big two. They didn't see an increased risk there. Uh, this is an interesting typo. We'll put this one on the screen. So the testosterone was administered through implants, which are pellets. What's the second one there? Tables. Tables. Tables! Or injections. Uh, how many tables of testosterone were they giving these women? Uh, probably one table a is day. This, is this like a, a drug bust where the cops go bust some steroid manufacturer and there's a table of steroids in front of them? I don't think they're giving them an entire uh, table of steroids. We, it's surely we can, tablets. We can throw a, uh, a picture in there of a, a steroid drug bust as a table unit of measurement. But yeah, this, this is in the official, I think, menopause journal of the European Society of something. Mm -hmm. um, and it just slipped through. So I thought it was comical. We'll put it in here. Maybe increase the salary for the peer reviewers. Yeah, it, something needs to be done. Uh, but 70% of these women were treated with pellets. Just, just my least favorite type of HRT. Mm -hmm. um, I might do this to one of my pets if there was an indication for the convenience of it. My oldest dog actually needs one right now. Yeah, I, I think of that your dog would DRT. be a good candidate for this, and he would probably be very happy and better off for it. But I don't think I would do this kind of procedure on a human. Probably not. Yeah, there's just better options. Subcutaneous testosterone has all of the benefits of a pellet, and then the pellet has many downsides that subcutaneous testosterone doesn't. Yeah, I think the only upside is there's probably a stronger placebo effect. It's almost like a sham surgery, right? The more mm. invasive something is, the stronger the placebo effect. So you take the placebo effect of testosterone, which we know is strong, the placebo effect of a minor surgical procedure, which is gonna be strong, and you're probably writing that a bit rather than the actual efficacy of the treatment. I see, it's like the um, the guy on Discord that More Plates, More Dates did a video about that was injecting testosterone and HGH, but directly into the penis. So it'll work better. Hmm, that sounds pretty invasive. <laughs> Very invasive. So probably a good placebo effect from that as well. Uh, and those are sort of the oldest and I guess most tried and true methods of you know, improving libido, sexual function, uh, the PDE5 more on the sexual function side, mm -hmm. testosterone more on the libido side of things. Um, and then along with came a new wave of um, either drugs being repurposed or drugs with all new FDA approvals altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one here is uh, Vilezi or yep. bromelanotide. So these are uh, working on the melanocortin pathway. There's various melanocortin receptors. And depending on which one you choose, whether it is bromelanotide, which is Vilezi or PT141, or set melanotide, which is Mvicri um, for obesity, um, or whether it is uh, old school melanotan 2 or melanotan 1. And there's a whole bunch of other, um, both short and long acting melanocortin receptor agonists. But uh, this is the one that we were talking about when he said it was FDA approved for hypoactive sexual disorder, at least in females. Yeah, in females it is approved. Um, it is only available as an injection at your, you go to your traditional commercial pharmacy. Um, 1.75 milligrams injected no more than twice per week. So they set the, they drew the line in the sand at eight doses per month. Um, and that's probably due to pigmentation concerns. 
um, because that is a, a side effect. You know, it's not perfectly clean. Anytime you're mm -hmm. acting on melanocortin, um, you can get some skin darkening. There's a MC4R and there's a M. M1 one CR, M1 CR. Those are the two significant yep. ones. They're also present in the gut, so you can get uh, nausea from this, um, and then of course in the skin as well. So I know that there's companies, and uh, perhaps uh, we may have uh, a scientist from one of those companies on to discuss these things at one point. Yeah, and there's no known mechanism yet, or it's incompletely understood as far as why activating these MCR receptors drive an improvement in libido. Um, the mm -hmm. story that I've heard told is as it relates to, you know, longer days and shorter days and uh, mating season and the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably about as close as we'll get to an understanding for the time now. Uh, but how much, how much weight do you think that that theory has? Because it's really just a theory yet. I mean, I don't know how you could conclusively prove that. Yeah, um, perhaps some. There is some evidence that alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, um, which is kind of one of the, I guess, endogenous analogs that works mm -hmm. on the melanocortin pathway, is one of those switches that kind of flips on the hypothalamus to release gonadotropin and releasing hormone. Um, and when you're releasing gonadotropin and releasing hormone, that's kind of like a, a mini ovulation. So perhaps that's one of the pathways. One of the other pathways is it can cause flushing of the skin. So if you think about flushing of the skin, um, Perhaps you're just directly leading to more fluid retention in tissues that might be touched Peripheral or more sensitive. Vasodilation. Yep. Yeah. Whether it's clitoral tissue or penile tissue. So maybe that's another pathway. But yeah, at the end of the day, um, we just know that it works clinically. We don't know exactly where the, the most uh, strong mechanism is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think... The striking thing here, again, in, in, in all these studies, you basically see this is the placebo response. So uh, about 40% of women, so this was the metric we're looking at here is the sexual encounters that were satisfying in the percent of those. So placebo, it was around 40%. Yep. And then when you look That's... at the, depending on which study you look at, uh, around 50% up to 65% of those being satisfying. Yep. So you do see more. It's not perfect. It's not like 100%. It's not going to be magic for everyone. And there are non-responders to this. Sad to side effect wise, like you mentioned, the nausea seems to be the big one. Yeah, even stronger placebo effect than a lot of um, mood medications. In depression, anxiety, etc., you have a very strong placebo response as well. But yeah, not, not terrible. We mentioned the nausea. Um, depending on the medication you're talking about, um, Spontaneous erection can be a side effect. Theoretically, probably preopism, but it's not one that's listed. Yeah, including clitoral preopism because that mm -hmm. can happen as it's an extremely rare condition, yep. um, but it is a rare cause of female genital pain. Um, I guess kind of on that topic, the next thing we're going to talk about is trazodone yeah. and some of its cousins. Yep. So nausea, about 40% across the board for bromelanotide. Yep. Pretty high, um, so it sounds bad, but then you also think, well, 60% of people used the medication and did not have nausea. Yep. So it, it would just be expected that you would mention that in these other things, yep. about a one in 20 chance of vomiting. Not great. Yep. Um, if only there were a way to dose it lower. Yeah, I've certainly heard, Annika, <laughs> there is ways to dose it lower, of <laughs> course. Uh, um, there, there's reputable compounding pharmacies that um, make these peptides. I guess the other thing we should mention with Phylicia or bromelanotide is it is a peptide which makes it um, work better and have less side effects. We can just ignore that 40% nausea rate. I don't think the nausea rate was 40% when it was called PT141. The nausea rate was 0%. Although I do know people who have taken melanotan 2 and vomited. Hmm. Yeah, we'll just ignore that and, and move on. Um, but yeah, classically, in fact, I think our friend Derek again, with more plates, more dates. Mm. I can't remember if it was him, but uh, I remember him telling, maybe it was like a, a Reddit story or something um, where people were horny, they had erections, but they were puking. It doesn't sound like a great combo. Not really. Uh, next we have the, I guess this is things that act on the serotonin receptors. So uh, trazodone is an older drug that's it's sort of being repurposed um, and then there is Addy or Flabanserin, which is a 
5-HT1A agonist and a 5-HT2A antagonist. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes these are used concurrently with uh, an SSRI to try and offset the side effects. Uh, that approach, hit or miss, I, I think less than half of people respond to that. Um, and not greater than half of people are going to respond to just taking this pill nightly. I think even in the best study, because they did three different phase three trials before they yep. got the approval, 50% uh, was the top line compared to a placebo response of around 30%. So just in terms of like, did they improve or did they not improve? About half of women will respond at best. Mm -hmm. And again, about a 10% rate of different side effects. If you look at uh, drowsiness or fatigue or you know, nausea, all these things can kind of come along with that. Yeah, one thing that uh, both the studies on these two compounds and the previous one found is despite a very high placebo response, the placebo adverse effects were relatively low. Yeah, so that makes you think that this is in fact related to the mechanism. And we yep. know that when you are sort of, say, just messing with the serotonin system, that you can have adverse GI effects. And I think if you're using this in the real world, you can probably attenuate those. So I might start a patient at 25 mg and then go up to 50 and then go up to 100, mm -hmm. just very slowly tapering um, so that they're getting acclimated to it and not going from zero to 100 milligrams. But yep. remember in these studies, they have to show a large effect in a small amount of time. And a lot of times that comes at the expense of adverse effects. Yeah. For those in other countries, Mianserin is kind of a cousin of these two. Uh, even mirtazapine is a little bit related, but not as closely. Um, as far as the serotonergic pathway, we'll talk about this later as well. But apomorphine is also a 5-HT2A antagonist. And then, uh, as we mentioned before, trazodone has a dose-dependent mechanism of action. So at lower doses, it will act more on adrenergic receptors. It works on alpha receptors. And then uh, at higher doses, the affinity for um, various serotonin receptors, whether it's an agonist or an antagonist, is going to increase. So 25 mg of trazodone is, has, com has quite different pharmacodynamics than 150 milligrams. Yeah, and I think the doses had to approach something like 300 milligrams as a cumulative daily dose to have antidepressant effects, which mm -hmm. it's a really crappy antidepressant because you're just going to be sleeping all the time. Yeah, it makes sense. You need so much serotonin that uh, you'll be tired when you take it. So it's almost like taking your um, uh, guanfacine mm. with taking uh, yeah. something serotonergic. It's like, oh, <laughs> it's nice <laughs> to be able to separate that out. So, of course, uh, it's used frequently off-label for insomnia. Yeah. And then we have, you can think of things like the bupropion and even you know, ADHD medications, stimulant medications. I've heard stories both ways from patients where they say that, you know, they had untreated ADHD and then they started on a, you know, amphetamine uh, compound or a, a Ritalin compound, methylphenidate. Mm -hmm. And it was like their libido was switched on and that was the right balance for them. And then I've heard the complete opposite where patients are experiencing ADHD, they get relief of their ADHD symptoms with these medications, but it tanks their libido. And I don't have a perfect explanation for that other than they're perhaps not quite able to get into that parasympathetic state if they've slightly overshot it. Yeah. Like just because you have a, an ADHD brain doesn't mean that your genital urinary system is also ADHD. So there may be a bit of a mismatch there in terms of norepinephrine, thinking of blood flow. Definitely. Um, the adrenaline to dopamine ratio in the system is going to be different than in, in the CNS is going to be different than in the genital urinary system. So again, it goes back to that teeter-totter analogy. Um, if you are taking, whether it's a dopamine agonist or a dopamine antagonist, if one of those is weighing too heavily on that teeter-totter and it just happens to get you in the right balance, then you'll have a good response. Yeah. And Something that's milder in terms of the potency than some of the stimulant medications is bupropion. So this is the generic Wellbutrin. It's available in a lot of different forms, a instant release, 12 hour, 24 hour release, all sorts of things. Um, I tend to prescribe more of the instant release or 12 hour just because mm -hmm. I don't think that people necessarily need 24 hours of constant dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake. Yep. Uh, but some people do experience better relief of symptoms on the longer acting. Um, and this is actually being repurposed in a, a drug that will potentially be called Lorexis. I, I believe mm -hmm. that's how you say it. It makes me think of the Lorax, for whatever reason, uh, brand recognition, I suppose. Yeah. 
but it's a combination of bupropion and trazodone, mm -hmm. which trazodone you tend to think of having the sedative qualities. Yep. And then bupropion you tend to think of having stimulating qualities. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting pair. Yep. Um, smart providers when this comes out are just going to prescribe the generics because you have cost and just it makes sense because you can see how many milligrams are going to be in this mm -hmm. thing. Reminds me of Contrave. Yeah. We don't know how many milligrams are going to be in it yet, though. They've done dose finding studies. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it looks to be fairly efficacious because the control that they're looking at here is actually bupropion by itself, which has approaching like a 45, 50% response rate. One of the most commonly prescribed medications for adult ADHD. Yeah, and the very last bullet point there, so sedative adverse effects, somnolence, mm -hmm. fatigue, sedation, reported by most patients, mm -hmm. but never severe. So most to me means greater than 50%. Yeah. I don't know that a lot of people are going to be thrilled to go on something like this, but again, you can slow down the titration whenever this is out or by microdosing, taking up a quarter of a tab of trazodone, something like that, mm -hmm. so that you're not getting snowed every time that you take a dose of the trazodone because it is very yep. sedating acutely. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting combo. Um, there's a lot of other molecules that could have been studied in place of it. For example, Sinocian bupropion or the um, meansirin, um, even mirtazapine instead of trazodone, although mirtazapine is pretty sedating too. Well, once uh, flibercerin is generic, then they'll make it into a combo drug. That, yeah, that's that the too. way it usually goes. Yep, because they want to. They don't want to stack patents. Uh, that's for sure. Um, anyways, I think that's a, a good summary of uh, trazodone of note, and maybe we'll link this. We will link this study. Um, trazodone, uh, commonly known as trazbone, as med students are learning about the side effect of priapism. Um, you know, some atypical or, or less well-known agents. So uh, I didn't know a whole lot about these before preparing for this podcast. Um, oxytocin, which yep. you know, people call the love hormone, and then apomorphine, which has very little to do with morphine. I think there's something in the extraction process, but yeah. it does not have any properties that are analogous to morphine yeah, whatsoever. It's not an opioid. So maybe the name was a bit of a, a killer for this drug. It yeah, the apomorphine, it's usually called APO, APO, usually all in caps. Um, it was previously kind of like, um, I don't know if I want to say marketed, but purported to help with um, detoxing from opioids, like uh, morphine and fentanyl. So perhaps that's why, but it's a very old molecule. It's been used for more than 100 years. Um, and this is, it's kind of repurposed. So it used to be used for Parkinson's disease because it is dopaminergic. And then, as we mentioned earlier, it's also, uh, I believe, a 5-HG2A um, antagonist. So um, sometimes it's combined with yohimbine, which also works on the yeah. alpha adrenergic system, but kind of the opposite. So it's a balancing effect. Yeah, so this one also works on alpha adrenergic system, which trazodone does as well. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if we mentioned that, but uh, this one seems to hit all of those targets except for... Uh, vasodilation. Yep. Uh, I mean, you could get that mediated by the dopamine effect. Uh, and I believe that works on the arterial side, not necessarily. It but does, yep. If you have a big venous leak like, and nothing is working for you, you probably need to see a urologist about that. Definitely. But sometimes if there's a slight venous leak, you can overcome that with more arterial flow um, up to a point, right? At, mm -hmm. at a certain point, the venous leak may progress. Um, but it has basically all the unique properties you would want. And as like a lot of these medications is the case, it yep. seems like the, the side effects or nausea is the limiting factor there. Dose-dependent nausea. Um, when looking into when doing the research for this, it was interesting because it's often used in dogs to induce emesis because a lot of times dogs you want the dog to throw things up. that they're not supposed to. Yep. And it works great in dogs. It uh, does not work well in cats because they don't have that same amount of uh, dopamine receptors, you, it kind of works, but they don't recommend it. Um, also, just kind of proving that cats can't love you the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we pose the question, are cats permanently motivated or permanently depressed and unmotivated? I've actually seen examples of both cats. Yeah, um, it, they just have a very narrow window of possibility. Dogs can be really sad. They can also be very motivated. They have a dopaminergic system more similar to humans, whereas uh, cats, no matter what, um, 
they're just going to be the same all the time. They Operating don't like, a, like a person on too high of a dose of an SSRI, slightly dampened dopamine. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the next one is oxytocin. This is also known as pitocin. You might have heard uh, your obstetric provider, if you've had a baby or if your spouse has had a baby, say, you know, uh, up the pit or um, we need more pitocin, you're bleeding too heavily, uh, you're hemorrhaging after um, you give birth. And uh, this is kind of like the, the love and connection hormone. So you think about oxytocin often goes kind of hand in hand with prolactin for lactation and breastfeeding. Um, oxytocin is a uh, pituitary hormone, but uh, for whatever reason, it's somewhat known as the monogamy hormone in females, but not in males, whereas antidiuretic hormone might have some effect there. Um, so uh, oxytocin is released when you have touching of the skin. So I suppose uh, if you're not able to touch each other, then oxytocin could be a good option to take exogenously, <laughs> but you can also form it endogenously. Uh, the good thing about it is you can combine it with other things and perhaps it's, it kind of has that synergistic um, uh, skin sensitivity mechanism. If you just feel like uh, the sensitivity of whatever skin, whether it's pubic skin or otherwise, um, yeah, make sure that uh, there's not something that you're on um, that's causing that skin to be less sensitive. Um, but also um, try to resensitize. It's almost like a, a positive feedback mechanism, especially in patients who are postpartum or patients after androgen deprivation therapy or patients after uh, like that are really uh, unsensitive to androgens that have been on a bunch of finasteride. That does happen. Um, but uh, this can be part of a stack and then um, it, it kind of has a synergistic effect with other ones. So this is, uh, to my knowledge, never used just by itself. Yeah, I, I've yet to seen it be used like that. I, I'm sure some biohack, biohacker out there is using it just by itself. Um, but speaking of combining things, we specifically recommend not combining these things unless you're specifically advised to do so by your care provider. Uh, yeah, all of these should be prescribed by your doctor. None should yes. be gotten off research chemical websites for exactly. animals. Uh, because the more of these things you add together, or if you're someone who has any kind of a coagulation predisposition, uh, then your risk of you know, priapism and just to scare people, permanent sexual dysfunction, the higher that risk is going to be as well. Yep. Penile amputation. Yep. That has a ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> I guess so. Um, yeah, I guess we could talk about uh, orgasmia, anorgasmia. Some definitions of anorgasmia, and I think anorgasmia, I think Latin. Anorgasmia, no orgasm. Seems pretty straightforward, but apparently it can basically mean anything that you want it to be, including delayed orgasm. Yeah, it can be not as intense as you want it to be. It can be taking too long. It can be a complete absence of orgasm. And this is pulled off of you know, several academic centers, definitions. Um, so not basically, today, I guess, yeah, <laughs> might as well not. <laughs> I think the hallmark here would be the level that it's distressing to the individual, yep. right? So you know, it's going to be different from person to person. It's very subjective. Um, so that's kind of a way to think about it. We, we could even say because everything is subjective and relative when it comes to sexual health, any provider who does anything to improve libido or sexual health is doing health optimization. Yeah, I mean, it is something that we know associates with longevity. I mean, people that have a healthy view of themselves sexually and healthy sex lives tend to have better longevity. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if it, I don't think it's a hallmark of aging by any means, but perhaps a, one you can use as a proxy or, you know. Yeah, a lot of individuals use their sexual health as a barometer for their combined mental and physical health. Because you can be perfectly physically healthy, but... Um, if your mental health is not good, for example, if you've had trauma or whatnot, or you have a mental health condition, then um, your sexual function can be very poor or your sexual, um, like where you want to be sexually, um, it can also not be there. Yeah, because you have so many systems that are having to work together simultaneously. So mm -hmm. it's not just blood flow. Yeah. You know, it's not just having an orgasm. It's not just being able to relax. You have to have all these things that are working mm -hmm. together at the same time. Yeah. And in the last decade or two, there's been this uh, excellent emphasis that, you know, mental health is important. It's okay to have a mental health condition. It is also okay to talk about it. And now there's definitely this, um, this kind of like next stream of 
um, culture, I guess, is it's also okay to care about and talk about your sexual health. And it's also okay to care about and talk about your hormone health. Yeah. I mean, in these things that were just not previously addressed in visits, very few you know, providers, physicians, nurse practitioners were asking about them. Um, and very few of them were doing blood work and probably still are not as far as, you know, hormone assessment, as far as the sex hormones, as we call mm -hmm. them. Um, but more and more, I, I do see s at least some attempt made towards checking hormones and patients that come to our clinic and have gotten some labs done. So I think it is starting to gain some traction, which is a great thing overall. Certainly. I guess we should also talk about priapism because we just spoke about half a dozen things that can increase your risk of developing priapism. When I learned about this in medical school, uh, a lot of times they talked about high flow priapism versus low flow priapism. Low flow, you're not getting enough oxygen to the tissue. And generally, uh, it looks like it, um, you know, a better delineation, I guess, is ischemic versus not ischemic. So ischemic is when you don't have oxygen, the tissue dies, it can become gangrenous, it can lead to amputation in the most severe cases. But in general, a lot of these things lead to a slightly higher flow priapism earlier. So this is why you hear on the commercials, if you have an erection lasting longer than four hours, then see a physician. Yeah, and I have never seen this in someone who is taking medication as prescribed. However, you know, back in my hospital days as an RN, every once in a while, you would see this pop up on the ER board or as an admission. Mm -hmm. uh, usually it was when people were taking too much of something that mm -hmm. they were prescribed, extra doses, uh, perhaps an anniversary or Valentine's Day, or if they were combining it with party drugs of some sort. Yep. Um, Very common. Another cause that I suppose we should be thinking about is the this is an interesting term. I, I've never read this stream of words together before, but uh, recreational use of intercavernosal injections. Yeah. So uh, intercavernosal injections, you might know them as trimix. It comes in a lot of different forms. In general, these are administered in the office because there is a very high rate, uh, as high as 5% of all intercavernosal injections um, have priapism secondary to that. Um, however, a lot of places just send these off for a patient to do at home and don't monitor or even like have them stay in the office at all. Yeah, that's sort of the downside of the wild west of telemedicine prescribing is that there is going to be patient harm. And in this case, the number needed to harm could be extremely low. It could be as low as 20 if yeah. you use that 5% figure. Another thing to keep in mind is let's say you have a bit of priapism, but you say, well, I'm not uh, using a recreational intracavernosal injection. And um, what could it be? And if you look at cases of idiopathic, so basically you can't find a cause, it's not trazodone or stalophil or um, trimix, 3.5% were malignancies. So that's something that uh, people should find out. Yeah. And this is due to, I mean, it's similar to having a predisposition to hypercoagulation, like a factor five Leiden mm -hmm. mutation or sickle cell, sickle cell is just very affecting common. the way that blood is able to flow through and you know, very small vessels that are draining the penile mm -hmm. tissue. So it may pop up there. Yep. I believe it's something like 30 to 40% of individuals with sickle cell will have a priapism at some point. Um, and there's also case studies of individuals, even just heterozygotes for factor V laden, um, combined with, um, you know, a, an adequately high dose of trazodone can lead to a very harmful priapism. Yeah, penile amputation in the book. We'll link this case in the, the show notes. Um, and I think that is the end that's of it. our sort of sexual optimization. I'm sure there's some vectors out there that we missed. Uh, we didn't put a particular emphasis on you know the therapy or CBT side of things because that's a, not necessarily our expertise, but I know that can be extremely valuable for people. Mm -hmm. So kind of keep that in mind. It's, it's just like with depression, you know, the best results are going to be with combination of lifestyle, you know, potential supplementation, potential therapy, potential medication, putting all these things together. So um, obviously not putting all these things together unless it's at the recommendation <laughs> of your healthcare provider. Not literally can't, putting them yeah, together. Can't say that enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as always, we hope that this has given you some extra tools to develop a balanced approach to your health, including sexual health. Um, and we appreciate your time. Leave any comments in the comment section below, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, wherever, and we will do our best to address them in a Q&A. 
Yeah, I'm sure we'll have a subsequent podcast and AMA to this one. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. May God bless you with health and happiness.